What's up, gangsters? How about many minutes of random that actually end up being mostly about just one thing? All right, so <clears throat> let's get to it. You guys know I always like to talk about magazines and books that I get in the mail, and this episode is no exception. And this is a really unique thing. Uh, Noah Krasowitz, who uh, has, uh, I'm sure he gets asked about this all the time, a very un-Japanese name, is one of the editors of this magazine, Scale Aviation in Japan. And uh, I think because he knows I'm working on this bare metal foil thing, he reached out and asked me if I wanted a, a copy of their latest issue. And of course I did, because it's always neat to see magazines uh, from other parts of the world, uh, you know, just to kind of get an idea for how uh, other uh, how, how the hobby looks in other countries. Anyway, so he sent me this, and this thing is really neat. <laughs> of course, the first thing that I had to get next to was the fact that it is, by Western standards anyway, backwards. Because when I was looking at it, I was like, wait a minute, this does not look like a front cover. This looks like a back cover, where there's usually ads. And then I clicked, and I was like, oh, yeah, wait a minute, this is Japan. So they flip their books from the right-hand side rather than the left-hand side. Um, at, uh, so uh, at any rate, uh, once I figured that out, that helped a lot. I still don't have any idea what's going on in here because obviously it is all in Japanese, but I can certainly see that it is a beautiful magazine. Um, it's kind of, they start out right off the bat um, with the usual things, table of contents, that's not really any different. Um, but uh, then we get right into this, <laughs> which is great. I mean, yeah, it's gratuitous and uh, I mean, it doesn't really have to be there, but hey, listen, I am never going to object to beautiful girls. So there you go. There's that. There's even a centerfold kind of thing. Um, let's see. Yeah, see? <laughs> right there. Yep. Centerfold. You can hang over your workbench. So if, you're, if you want to do that. So that's pretty cool. Then we get right into some really beautiful uh, aircraft. And, and, and this, epi this episode, <laughs> this issue seems to be completely dedicated, almost anyway, to bare metal uh, finishes. Um, this is uh, Jin uh, uh, Tuma's, uh, sorry, I am totally screwing that up. Uh, Jun Tenma's, his, his, I don't know, maybe I'm going to try to pronounce his full name. Junpei Tenma. This is his F-86, which some of you may have seen on the old interwebs. This one is actually covered with uh, litho plate. And of course, it is gorgeous. Um, this one I thought was uh, covered in foil or litho plate, but this one is actually not. This one is actually done with, um, I believe, just uh, SM-206. Yep, the uh, really good aluminum metallic from Mr. Color. But he's done a lot of stressed skin effects where he's uh, you know, done that by sanding and grinding, so that's pretty cool. But then you get to this one, and you can see my whole issue, because even in tiny photos, you can really see how much difference real aluminum makes. And there you go, there's a little bit of a better look at that. It's just, you know, it's just a thing. Uh, Junpei's uh, uh, process, though, is is really gnarly, and this is why I've said that I just don't know if, if, if I can't solve my foil problem with foil, why I don't want to go into litho plate because it's a whole different deal. Like he is gluing litho plate on with epoxy. He dr has to drill holes in all of the surfaces and there's a picture that shows that I think. He drills holes in all the surfaces to allow the epoxy to uh, bleed through to the inside of the model um, so that it's not squeezing out between the panel edges. You can see that picture right there. Um, some of his parts, he's actually making a, a like a, a die so that he can form uh, parts uh, into those dies with sheet. Uh, it's gnarly, uh, and, and obviously, with litho plate being slightly thicker, it, it gives you dimensional changes that have an effect on everything. So, yeah, it's uh, it's a whole couple of orders of magnitude beyond um, 
the regular thing. This is a project by a, a female Japanese modeler. She's done with uh, Molito ink, so that's pretty neat. Anyway, this is just a really cool. Uh, again, just neat stuff. Neat to see how they approach the hobby, how they look at it. So there's that. Then coming back across the pond, sort of, uh, to uh, more sort of what I consider normal, is this lovely new issue of Ming Air Modeler. And it's even different to American Hands because it's on this A4 size. The other one is like a little shorter than normal for Americans. Anyway, whatever. It's still cool. And this is, uh, this, this might be the greatest issue of a model airplane magazine I've ever seen in my entire life. This is exactly what I want a model making magazine to be. Totally inspirational. The kind of stuff where you just drool over the pictures and then you kind of can't wait to read about it to see, you know, how did they do that stuff. This thing on the cover, right off the bat, this is a fully scratch built 1 8 scale Newport 11 and it's just incredible. But one of the things that I was most looking forward to seeing is right off the bat, you've got uh, my buddy Fanch Lubin's F-18 Aggressor built off of the uh, Academy 132nd kit and it is just a work of art. It's maze balls. We got to see this thing come together on Facebook and in Scale Modeler's critique group and, and then it's really cool to see uh, to see it in print, especially with, you know, the beautiful photography and layout that David Parker and Mark Neville do over at AFV Modeler with both their magazines, Air Modeler and uh, 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 Ming uh, AFV Modeler. Uh, it's just really, really good stuff. Uh, so if you don't have a subscription, you know, get yourself one. This is the only model making magazine that I have felt compelled to buy a subscription to. Uh, at a minimum, see if you can figure out how to get uh, get it on the newsstand or go over to afvmodeler.com and you can purchase individual articles in PDF format um, and uh, check them out on your computer or your iPad. So anyway, that, very cool, good, good stuff. Now back to my project. Um, I am continuing to work on the uh, Ming Superbug and it has been bugging me. <laughs> this was supposed to be a, you know, sort of relaxing, just knock it up kind of build with nothing, you know, no rabbit holes gone down, no, uh, you know, no, no, nothing, nothing crazy. But uh, yeah, it, it somehow never works out that way. Uh, at any rate, uh, it's been, it's been, I mean, it's overall been good. I just got really bogged down with the intakes. And I'll talk about that here in a second. But let me kind of walk you backwards through where this is at right now, because I've got the upper and lower halves just dry fit. And I just, this is, this is something that's worth looking at. Um, anybody who's, who's getting ready to build this kit, it's really good to know that the fit on this thing and the engineering is really super impressive, like Tamiya level impressive uh, for the most part. The engineering is, is definitely next level and I'll show you some of that uh, in a second when I take these, these two halves apart. Um, but, but anyway, look at the fit, all right? You can see, and I, these flies, you wouldn't even believe. I, I, I'm sure I'm gonna get some comments on my YouTube, can't you get rid of the flies? And honestly, those comments are about as annoying as the flies themselves. If I could, trust me, I would. But you have no idea how bad the flies are this year. It's really uh, kind of epic. Uh, it's, yeah. I have fly traps, I have fly bait, I have bug zapper, everything. But I also have 25,000 cows within a five mile radius of my house. And uh, yeah, it's a problem. Anyway, back to uh, hornets rather than flies. So uh, you can see um, like the fit of this joint between the upper and lower half of the leading edge is pretty good. Um, the joint here where you put the cover for the boarding ladder in, because I'm not gonna have the boarding ladder out, is pretty good, but it's still a joint slash panel line with all of the frustrations uh, that you have with that. But um, look at the fit here, all right? This, 
you almost can't tell from looking at this where the joint is between the upper and the lower half if it wasn't for this right here that I'm not squeezing together. But it is super impressive. And I will just point it out. Um, it runs from right here back along here. You can see where I've already, I've already adds down what little evidence there was. Then it goes up here and then across here, obviously, you can see that. Just a really good fit. And then look at how tightly it fits right here between this part of the wing and this part of the fuselage all right in here. So you have nothing to worry about as far as filling or anything right there in that corner, which is greatness. The uh, other joint that you can't see is between the outside of the intake, which is this piece here that forms the outside, the top and the bottom of the intake. Um, it, I mean, I've already filled it in, but there's a joint that runs, um, it runs uh, across, let's see, let me get my pointer again. Uh, it runs right here and then turns and cuts across. And, um, Fortunately, those are both panel lines, and they're not too bad here. They're not great. I'm going to have to do a little bit of work there, but they're not bad. Then the joint turns and runs right along this corner right here, and that's not supposed to be there. Um, I've already filled that and uh, primed and everything. And what I basically tried to do here, as you can see, because I wanted to be able to get the wheel bays all painted and detailed and weathered and installed, and then I'd have to worry about masking afterwards because uh, it's a complicated mask line with this zigzag shape around the edge here. So I pre-primed and painted all the way around the openings there um, so that my masking, such as it is, because I'm not going to be able to avoid it completely, obviously, I'm going to have to do some painting and masking right there, um, but for the most part, my masking doesn't have to be precise at all. So that's all taken care of and done. These uh, wheel bays were done uh, just in uh, MRP white. Then I did all the detail painting um, and uh, then uh, came back and used some magic wash. And it's, you know, it's pretty dramatic. I mean, it's maybe a little more dramatic than I might want, but I don't, you know, I don't hate it. it. It makes the detail pop and you can see how beautifully molded all that detail in there is. And I, and this is going to be a dirty bird. So I, I want that, you know, to, I want the insides of the gear base to reflect the filth in there. So again, this might be a little bit melodramatic, but it really pops and it'll show up really well in the finished product. And again, part of the point with this build for me is to not agonize over every single thing which yeah that went out the window as soon as I started dealing with the intakes so let me take this apart and I will show you what's going on in there and this is again a place where the engineering on this thing is really impressive uh, you'll see how this how these two top how these two pieces fit together assuming I can actually get them back apart and you'll see why it's tight there's a, a peg and a hole system inside there. And it is a pretty tight fit. There we go. There's that side. Okay, so you'll see. And this is this is all this is really a minor complaint, but you can see these two pegs fit into these two holes. And it is a nice, tight, line-to-line -line fit. And it's a little bit uh, of a hassle when you're, when you're assembling it because there's no lead-in chamfer on the inside of the female or the outside of the pin. You can see I actually added one myself. And that's a little annoying because that's just a fundamental mechanical engineering thing to use lead-in chamfers. Um, and it's not like it's a problem to mold that, but you know, obviously it's easy enough to add yourself. It's just if, if, if it were truly completely and elegantly engineered, it would be there already. And this is not just a gripe with Ming. This is a gripe with pretty much every kit. Even Tamiya doesn't seem to observe the lead-in chamfer thing. But anyway, nonetheless, the engineering and the fit on this thing really is pretty good. Let me set this aside. And let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the intakes. So obviously, with the intakes, 
you've got the seam to deal with. And if you don't want that to show, that's quite a bit of work. Now, <laughs> there's a trick that some people do where they take these intakes and they go down to the Lowe's or the Home Depot or whatever the do-it-yourself store in your area is, and you buy a quart of white latex house paint. And I don't know if it's supposed to be gloss or flat or whatever. Some guys have even told me that they use Kills, which is a white uh, latex primer, basically. Um, I, I honestly wish I had not thrown away my bottle of white Steinol Res that I just wasn't using anymore and was like five years old because I could have used that. At any rate, you basically put tape over the bottom end of the intake and then fill the thing with, with the white latex paint and then dump it out and allegedly it's going to give you this perfectly smooth finish that fills in the joint. <laughs> yeah, I say allegedly because no, it was a total fail for me. The first time I did it, I tried the paint at full thickness. It looked like ass. There were just lumps and, and runs and it, it, just, it was terrible. Um, I did not prime the inside of the parts first. I was told I didn't necessarily need to, so I blew that off. So I stripped all that shit out of there. And let me tell you something, house paint is tough shit. I mean, it's, you know, they claim like 100-year durability for a reason. I scrubbed that shit out of there with, uh, with a uh, shitty airbrush brush. You know, the, the bristle ones that you should never actually use on your airbrush. And a bunch of lacquer thinner. Um, and then I thinned it in half with water, like some people suggested. Tried that, didn't work. I, I tried brushing it in, I tried spraying it in. It just looked like absolute shit. And so, uh, and it was not concealing the joint. So, uh, what I did is I went back and I was like, all right, fuck all that. I'm gonna go back to something that I know. I got all that paint out of there again for the second time. Mixed up some 2K gloss urethane clear, some UPAL to be exact, and I blew that in there about five layers thick so that it was all glossed up like a glazed donut in there. And, uh, well, I should say, before I did that, I actually worked the joint um, using just old-fashioned you know, methods. I, I did some sanding. I put a sanding sponge on the end of a, of a stick Worked it around inside there to get it mostly taken care of. Then I used some of uh, my black Star Blonde Super Glue, which is my new sort of favorite thing. Um, and then I did the chemical sanding method where you reach in there with uh, a Q-tip soaked in debonder and just work it down as smooth as possible. And that actually worked pretty well. Um, and then I blew the 2K urethane in there. And uh, then... I uh, primed it and painted it with MRP white. And it was, it was, it really turned out to be pretty good. I had a little bit more work to do, a little more filling and a little more sanding uh, because uh, you could still see the joint a little bit on the bottom. And that's the most important part. Um, so I felt uh, pretty happy with that. And I'm gonna see if I can turn my, my phone flashlight on and maybe you'll be able to see inside there, if I get the angle right. Let me see if I can do this. This is gonna be a one-armed wallpaper hanger kind of an affair. So there you can maybe, yeah, maybe kind of see in there. Come on. Possibly uh, getting the angle of the, okay, there we go. Now if I can just get that on, oh. So yeah, I can see it, but the angle's not right for the camera. And I'm sure, oh, maybe, yeah, this is not gonna work. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, it's not, it's, it's not perfect, but it's not, it's pretty good. It's totally usable. Um, the, only, uh, the only part that you can kind of see right there at the front is there's a little bit of a lip where the intake, uh, the, the, the inside trunk mouth meets the outside rear edge. 
And that's, there's just nothing you can do about that. That's just a fit thing. There's, you know, it is what it is. Now, let me talk about how I got that in there and how I got the uh, perfect color separation between the white on the inside and the gray on the outside. Because, you know, if you, that's, that's like a, obviously not something you want to have to mask. So what I did was I went off script. Let me show you how the uh, book would have you do this. Because if you're going to build this kit, I think this is a pretty good hack. Uh, so, here we go. This is the deal. Alright, so, you build, the, uh, you build the intakes and you attach them to the wheel bay sub-assembly. And it's really pretty amazing how well those parts all fit together. Really Tamiya level. Then what they want you to do is you attach this outer portion of the intake mouth uh, to the center section. Then you take the inner, inner trunk assembly uh, and attach, sub-assembly, and attach it to the center section. You can see all that. Then you take the outside of the intake and attach that to the whole thing that you got going there. Now that that would all work. That all that all works fine. That's all great and good if you are going to, uh, you know, if you're going to paint all this stuff afterwards. Um, which you know, okay. Let me let me let me back up here. It's all good if you paint the insides of this part and this part here with light ghost gray first, and your intakes are already paint. The inside of your inner trunk is already painted white, and then you assemble all that together, and all your color separations are fine. But what you have is the joint between this edge here, this edge here and the inner piece right here, top and bottom. Now, look, the joint is really, really good, okay? Don't get me wrong, it's like pretty much not noticeable, but pretty much not noticeable was not gonna be good enough for me. So, but the obvious problem is that you cannot assemble that, deal with the joint in there, because it's right here in that corner and then right down here in this corner. You obviously can't deal with that joint and then prime and paint the inside of the intake mouth without masking off the inside of the intake trunk, right? That's a problem. And the only way to solve that is to change up the assembly order so that you build all of this outside stuff. You put this piece on the center section first, deal with the joints, prime, paint, etc. do all that, and then put the intake in afterwards, okay? Now, the problem is that you physically cannot do that. You just can't. Um, there's just too many things in the way. They never intended for it to happen like that. Um, and uh, so to be able to means doing some hacking and grinding and chopping. And uh, it's fairly, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's I want to say it's kind of straightforward, but it's also kind of maybe not a beginner move either. It's definitely not something you want to do without having a prox on. So it's, it's going to be kind of hard to see with all the stuff uh, put together, but I'll try and show you. The first thing you got to do, because what happens is, once this is all put together, the trick is that you're basically going to put shove the, the snout of the intake down in there, and it's gonna go in at an angle like this, and then you're gonna pivot it down until the bottom portion of the wheel bay subassembly kind of snaps in, and it's a, and it's a pretty, pretty close line-to-line -line fit between this ridge right here and this ridge back here. And, and part of what enables you to do it is that even though you've glued 
the front portion of this outside intake section here all along this joint and it's secure you have to leave it loose back here until later so all that being said in order to get the mouth of the trunk to go into this space right here you have to relieve some material and you can see where I've done some grinding with my Proxon right here relieved a lot of material there and you got to be careful not to do too much and pop through to the outside you don't want to do that but you relieve material there you relieve material along the edge of this thing right here that that rib thing right there see how much thinner it is you can see I ground it on both sides you could almost just cut it out I don't really know what true purpose it serves right there but at any rate thinning it was good you also need to chamfer the leading it the, the outside of the intake mouth itself and, and, and doing all that should oh there's also a little bit of material right down in here that you have to relieve right in there that should enable you to get the intake trunk mouth to go into the hole that it fits in and it's a relatively close fit it's it's a smaller opening than what you see right here I mean they've engineered it where it's it's you know it, it's pretty precise so that's half the battle or most of the battle actually but even if you get that to happen you can't hinge this thing down and snap it into place without chopping off the corner of this bulkhead thing right here and it's going to be a little bit hard to see but maybe you can see it better on this side right here anyway you can see it right there and if you look down inside there you'll see that i have have chopped that off at like a, a 60 degree angle um, and and that will allow the uh, bottom portion of the wheelbase subassembly to clear as you hinge it down into that space and then once you get it all in there you can run some extra thin along in here it's i mean it glues up really nice and tight then once that's all secure then all you got to do is take and squeeze this side in add a little drop of super glue and hit it with some kicker to hold it in place and then come back with your extra thin to get everything nice and welded up and you got that business right there now once you get all that done then you've got some panel lines that have to get dealt with and i know this is running long but i'm going to show you very quickly because ming has taken some sort of liberties with the panel lines obviously you got to deal with the panel line left by the joint it's not really a panel line it should not be there at all the other ones that you have to work on are this th this panel line th this joint should be a panel line from here to right here that stays from there on though it all is supposed to go away also in addition to getting rid of the joint ming has taken some artistic license and added <laughs> a panel line this panel line right here that runs all the way back and yeah, it's not supposed to be there either so you can get rid of that then you've got right here you can barely see it but right here that is a witness from a from a slide and it runs all along there and that also should be sanded off if you care about that that sort of thing then you've got a little bit of a joint right here that needs to be dealt with then this joint all the way around here under the lex also has to go away and you know that's a little bit of a challenge because of course you've got um, uh, some uh, panel lines that cross that but look at how nicely that just goes together now that I got those leading edge chamfers on those pins anyway you've got some challenges here because 
that joint's got to go away, but you've got some panel lines that run across the joint, and you've got to preserve those, if you, again, if you care. So anyway, some panel line challenges, but um, overall, nothing that, uh, you know, nothing that should be any hill for a stepper. And overall, I just really do love the, uh, the engineering and the fit on this thing. Once I got past the intake debacle, it started to get fun again, and I'm looking forward to moving on. So that's that. That's enough.